Hello, and you're welcome to yet another edition of my opinion on Cleveland and TV in Diaspora. Like I always tell you, Cleveland and TV in Diaspora is an online platform created to bring together Africans back home and in Diaspora to celebrate and appreciate our successes, achievements, businesses, and lots more. We encourage you, therefore, to keep signing up with us on the Cleveland.com. Thank you. Today, we'll be discussing the African women. Uh, summit 2023, and my guest this afternoon is uh, Mr. Kalada Belema Meshak Hart. Mr. Meshak Hart is the Executive Director of Engage Empower Education Initiative. Mr. Hart, you're welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, we would like to start with this. Uh, you seem to be very versatile in the in area of technology, IT, and uh, even women and uh, development. But before we get to that, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? All right, all right. my name is Belamani and I'm the Executive Director of Engage and Power Education Initiative, a non-profit based in Nigeria with the primary focus to empower the woman and the girl child. Sorry, your company is it based in Nigeria or in South Africa? It's based in Nigeria. The NGO is based in Nigeria. Based in Nigeria. Okay, like I said earlier, uh, I said you, you you seem so very much interested in the uh, women education. But tell us more about your own company, which is the Engage, um, Empower, and the Educative Initiative. What is it all about? Uh, well, it's an NGO. It, it's basically a non-profit organization that was set up in 2018 uh, with the simple agenda of empowering women and girls. Um, we are focusing on four of the SDG goals. Ending poverty, ending hunger, girl child education, and peace and security uh, in Africa. So those are our four focal points. Then, and we have projects around these focal points. Um, we basically send girls back to school. We send close to um, 100 plus girls back to school. Um, we've partnered with an agency to um, empower 540 girls in STEM education. We also started our She Tech Hub, our tech hub for just women to teach them tech. We have our first graduate of 10 um, girls that had zero knowledge on coding, but are now full core front end developers and are currently interviewing for internship with InterSwitch. And that is a pilot project. We intend to scale that up to about 100 girls and eventually we intend to churn out 1,000 to 10,000 girls yearly that are tech um, enthusiasts and professionals. We also have um, what is called the food bank, um, where we empower, sorry, where we empower uh, people with food every year. Whenever there's food in the bank, we, we empower women, especially with food, uh, where so that they can get something to eat. We've done that to about a thousand women. Then we have our Africa, our African Women Summit, which is basically an annual advocacy arm of the, the NGO, where we organize the Africa Women's Summit to promulgate peace uh, development in the continent is annually. This is the fourth edition of the event so far. Is, is that right? We'll actually get to that and you have opportunity to speak extensively on that. But let me come in here. Why the interest in women? You are obviously a male and you have so much interest in developing the, the, male, the female child. Why such yeah. interest? Thank you. Thank you. I get this question consistently. And um, basically, the passion stems from the fact that um, I am the product of a woman, and I and I sincerely believe that women, if given the opportunity, can do a lot. So when I begin to see that the challenges they face, uh, I ask myself, how can I help solve these challenges so that we can see the best of our women? That's why I got into this space, um, and I've been here since 2018. And slow and steady, we'll be moving, and we've been trying our best. A good one. So, why did interest? Let, let, let me guess your view on the gender equality. I didn't hear you. Let Let me guess your views on gender equality. Okay. Uh, basically, I stand with the global um, standards on gender gender equality. It's part of what we push for. Um, and you see, it's it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work to even get to that position. And basically, the women are not even asking for a favor. They're just asking for what is theirs to be given to them. Um, gender equality, gender parity, and I like the, the fact that some European countries are beginning to get close to that. You can see female football football teams earning 
the same as the male football teams. Um, so it's a lot of work, especially in the patriarchal society which we live in. But I believe it's very possible. We are not saying we are not saying give any special preference to women, but we are saying if you have an equally qualified man and equally qualified woman in the same position, you should be able to earn equality. So um, and um, gender parity and pay parity is also part of what we push. So now let's look at your work with um, with girls, women in Africa. Now let's look at it. How has been your experience in the field? Wow. Um, it's it's been a, a roller coaster ride. Um, I, I finally found out that you can't actually solve all their problems. That's the truth. And I'm thinking, sincerely speaking, advocacy is a better route than solving the problems, because you begin to see that most of the problems can only be solved by governments that has a huge budget that they've made for such. So the best is to put pressure on governments to do what they have to do. That's the way. I mean, how many girls can you send back to school? Mm, that does not mean whatever we are doing in our small space, right, is not recognized. But to j really get results, best is to push government to do what they have to do. Then you can do what you're doing in your small space. Um, we, we have the access to finance events we organize. It's where we can we help women prepare for finance. Because most women think um, um, it's their right to get funding. But when you're de dealing with a banking institution that does not understand these issues, basically they're into business for profit, then you have to prepare yourself to access these funds. Good thing is that most banks and most donor agencies have special packages for women. But even to access those packages, you have to be prepared. So that's how access to finance comes into play. We help women to put their books together, tell them what is necessary and what is needed to have access to finance. We also have the Build to Last series where we notice that women just out of a passion, because women generally are built to be helpers, right? So out of passion to help, they start doing things for people without properly going the legal way to start up their organizations and setting up. Two years, three years down the line, they now see a need to be legalized and they've lost all the things they did in the past because in M and E, what is not recorded did not happen, right? So we are telling them, okay, from the start, begin to put your records in place, begin to put systems, begin to build structures in place. So that's our um, build to last series for women. So, so that's one of the things we are doing to help women. It's not been an easy road, trust me. Um, especially when it's a man leading this project. And I was talking to the Commonwealth General, um, the Commonwealth Secretary General, sorry, uh, and I told that they need to have room for more he for she heroes. I'm an ambassador of the National Council of Women's Society. I was made a he for she by that organization. And my award is just here by my side. And uh, basically, I'm one of the few men that sit into the women's meeting uh, nationally because National Council of Women's Society is the only body in Nigeria recognized by government to be the umbrella body for women. And I'm an ambassador for that organization, and they recognize me as a he for she because of the work I've been doing for women. So we need more he for she's in this space, but the women need to encourage that because there's no conversation about women that you don't want to have a man there because finally you get to a man to make those approvals. Um, if you're very conversant with Nigeria and what's happening in Nigeria, the gender bills that were taken to the National Assembly, after all said and done, they were all thrown out because they didn't have enough women there and they didn't have enough men in their team to, <clears throat> to get it done. So when I speak, I tell women, men are your co-collaborators. Co you're not fighting, you know, don't fight with them. Collaborate. Get them to your side. Get them to your corner. Get them to those meetings. Let them understand the issues and support you. But it's been a very challenging prospect, but very, quite interesting. I won't see myself doing anything else. But you, you made mention of a government coming in to, in to encourage women to do one or two things to help themselves. Now, what are your views? What do you think the government should do in setting such system right to give out opportunities for more women to come in into? Uh, well, I think what is the role of the has already put in place opportunities for women. I think the basic, the basic challenge and the major challenge is to implement and follow up on these things. I think there are a lot of projects by any government in any African country for women. They would not say it's not there. But how much funds do they allocate to the projects in the first place? How many people are aware of the projects? Are you getting me? So government knows what to do. Government is doing. So the, that's why you need the civil society organizations to also hold government accountable in these regards, right, as regards to what they are doing for women. So I think they already have those projects. We encourage, for instance, no government will say they don't want to send girls back to school. No government will say they are not doing anything to empower men. There's market money. They have, these things are in place, but how effective is it? How much funding have they allocated for these things? And who are who is even assessing those um, benefits being given yeah. out by the government? Yeah. And then, then we have to ask again now, the government, you just made mention of something, you said the government knows what to do. 
supposing they don't really know what to do because they discover that it takes a whole lot of distance from whatever implementation from the head down to the to the grassroots. Okay, now who is to be held responsible for that gap? Who is to fill that gap between the head and into the grassroots? Whose responsibility? I, I still is? don't believe the government doesn't know what to do. There's barely any government that does not have a minister of women affairs. I mean, in Nigeria, we have our Minister of Women Affairs. They are the ones responsible. They are the ones supposed to speak for women. Go to the Minister of Women Affairs, you see huge projects lined up to do. So the government knows what to do. The government has, every government has a Minister of Women Affairs. None. Go and check across Africa. There's always a ministry like that. Minister of Women Affairs. Yeah, you know, the, challenge is, the challenge is projects, funding. Are you getting me? Projects, funding. That's the challenge. So how, how, how do one really get funding for those projects? I, I, I didn't want us to be specific about it. How do one get funding for this project? Because you discover that at the end of the day, it is even those that do not really need this funding and eventually get it. Now, so they, those are the grassroots that will not have access to governance. Uh, how do they get this funding? Well, uh, governments have the way they access funding from international. International donor agencies would rather work with government, trust me, right? What the WHOs, the World Bank, they have projects they work directly with government on and they look at the implementation plan and strategies. The people that are challenging with access to funding are the civil society organizations like us and NGOs like us and small organizations. That's why I said most of the work would have to be done by the government because they have access to these huge funds. Basically, what CSOs and NGOs should do should be advocacy. Government has access to these funds. Most governments will not get these funds from these um, international donor agencies because there's no transparency in the process. See all the money they gave Nigeria for elections that just ended. You think, the, you think these international donor agencies will bring out money again to give Nigeria for elections? They won't because there's no transparency in the process. So the money is there, the funding is there. They can access it because they are government. Are you getting me? But how, would you, how transparent can you be, are you getting me, in managing those funds, in the process of managing those funds, in monitoring and evaluation, and ensuring that it's not those in government that are, you're, you're using to give patronage to receive the funds, like you have said. And those are the grass, grassroots that really need this funding. It doesn't get to them. So this, And those funds can only be accessed by governments. The World Bank will not deal with an, NG, an, an, an individual CSO or NGO. They will deal with government. And once they don't see transparency in government, forget about that fund. It goes to an African country that is serious about what they are doing. All right, let, let, let's discuss it. We've talked more about that and we do hope that the necessary department do one or two things about it to alleviate the pains and the stress of the girl child in the grassroots, living without living without access to the government itself. And we do hope that one or two things are done to contain such excesses. Now, let's discuss about the African Economic Congress. You are a co-final of that organization. What is it all about? Okay, I, I, I won't want to go further into that conversation because I left the AEC a while back. Um, I was a co-founder. We started it, I think, in 2019. Yes. We had our first event, and after the first event, I left the organization, so I don't really know what's happening with them. So now I'm purely focused on my own NGO and the African Women Summit. There's no problem. Now, you were once say I, I like to divide a, a little bit or a bit so. Your, your personal work before now. You were once, uh, I think, the press secretary to the former, to the wife of the former president of the country. Yes. This is John, uh, good luck, Jonathan. Yes. Right. So how, what was your, let, let's take a look at her office as, as, a, as a female, and as a woman, as a wife of the vice, uh, 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 the wife of the president. What her responsibility, how do you think she was able to affect the women? Well, um, you know, uh, her excessive president, Jonathan, did a lot of work while she was in office. How be it, I worked with her out of office. But I can say clearly, during her time was was um, when you, you could see that women had representation across the country. I mean, every state had a very viable first lady that was that was very active and shown because of what, you know, she's a very strong personality, Her Excellency, patient, a very strong personality. And someone that is very conscious about women empowerment and what and the fact that women can really play a role. You remember, she cried very mentally for 35 percent affirmative action, and Good Luck Jonathan did it during her time. He did it. So uh, you, you need a you need a very strong personality as a wife of a president to really implement some of these things women are crying for. And that's why I said that at this election, the women missed it. The women missed it at this last election. They did not take advantage of their voting block. Nobody negotiated anything with any presidential aspirants. You could not see any women group coming together and asking for things. So they, they, they lost it. And I, I, it's sad to say that whoever becomes the next president might not take the women seriously in, during their tenure because 
they, they, they didn't come as an organized block, although they make over 40% of the voting block. Look at all the videos circulating around people that went out to vote. Women. When I went out to vote, we had a majority of 70% women. These women came 7 a.m. and were there till 9 p.m. when the votes were counted. Women have, have also always shown an interest in politics, have always shown an interest in, in politics, have always shown their passion in voting, but never ever when the candidate gets into power does he see, see them important. They are only used for elections and dumps. The women need to come and form a voting block. They need to come and make requirements so that when these people get into office, these people can do something for them. However, albeit as an organization, we went to their manifestos and brought out what they said they would do for women. And we are calling it follow the campaign promises. So whoever finally gets inaugurated on May 29th will be able to follow up what they said they would do in their manifesto. Very shabby promises in their manifesto. Very shameful. Some of them just barely have a page of a manifesto of 1900 pages is what they say they will do for women. Very shabby, very shameful. But that's where we are and that's what we have. Yeah, but in Africa, you agree with me that the women are, are rated as second-class citizens. They are over-dominated by the men for. So what do you think can be done to bridge this gap of, uh, of dominance by the men? Um, this is where we are. This is where we have found ourselves. You know, women need to begin to organize themselves, right, and think outside the box. I've said it severally. Women are still thinking inside the box, especially in Nigeria. Look at uh, Rwanda. Rwanda has over 61% of women representation, representation at the National Assembly. It didn't happen by magic, right? They, they came together and agreed on the law that is constitutional for a certain percentage of the seats to be given to women. Let the women go and slog it out amongst themselves in the field. If, if we don't have a quota system for women, we will continue like this. I mean, there's nothing, about, there's nothing we can do about it. We must have a quota system for women. Excuse me, and guess what? It should start from the local government level. It must start from the local government level. I mean, local government elections, they must have roles for women. State assembly elections before the national elections. And trust me, they start that way. They begin to grow. And in not too this disaster time, you're going to see a lot of representation of men in national assembly. Then they can begin to pass bills. Then they can have the numbers to negotiate with the men and pass deals. Because you see, this man won't give you anything on a platter of gold. I'm a man, I know what I'm telling you about. They won't give you anything on a platter of gold. These same men agreed to pass the bills for the women. The, Her Excellency, the, the wife of the president, Aisha Bari, went to the National Assembly to appeal to them. They told her, yes. When voting time reached to vote for the bills, all the bills were thrown out. All, not one, passed. That's interesting. We'll take a short break here when we come back, we'll continue with the conversation. Clevenard in Diaspora Television is an internet online TV service. What sets us apart is a unique combination of hit African content, first and exclusive international free movies, series, music, news, events, documentaries, tourism, teleshopping shows, youth TV programs, and live interviews. Clevenard Diaspora Television is available throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and to the diaspora markets worldwide. Take your entertainment with you wherever you go. Watch on your smartphone, tablet, laptop, smart TV, depending on your device. Watch free movies with Clevenard Movies Television. Stop searching for free movies websites and watch Clevenard Movies Television. Watch your favorite African shows anywhere at any time. Don't forget to check out our top five TV channels created to get you informed. TV1, Clevenard in Diaspora Television. TV2, Clevenard Youth Television. TV3, Clevenard Movies Television. TV4, Clevenard Teleshopping Television. TV5, Clevenard Tourism Television. To start watching, sign up at www.clevenard.com and follow the easy steps. Once you're done, log in to the Clevenard website or app on your device, click on any one of our five TV channels and hit play. We will be very satisfied and happy to welcome you to our team as one of our new business partners. Contact info at clevenard.com plus 34631-2798. One, one. Website www.clevenard.com. Welcome back, and you are still on to my opinion on Clevenard TV in Dallas, And if you are yet to sign up with us, to please do that now on www.clevenard.com. Thank you. 
We are still with Mr. Meshach Han, and we are discussing the African Women's Summit 2023. Mr. Hart, you are a media expert, right? And then um, we've said one or two things about the just concluded election. All right, now what do you think is the place of the media, okay, in creating an enabling environment for businesses, for things to strive in any nation? Uh, the, 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 the place of media is actually to set um, the agenda for conversation, right? The government is the one that is responsible to, to make things thrive and set a, um, have a good environment. Um, so the media yeah, is... But it, it, you know, the, the media sets an agenda, but it can ever either be negative or positive. Um, what do you think? Idea, that's that's why the media, is, um, the media is properly moderated by the NBC. It can't be negative. Are you getting me? It's basically positive, right? Anyone that wants to create strife, we, we, we can see what the media can do. And that's why other countries are taking notes. What happened in Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda started from a radio station, started from broadcast. So the broadcast media is quite important. So they are properly monitored. So, but the media basically sets an agenda. The government is the one responsible to create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. So, but do you see a negative uh, interference from the social media? Now, when you go online, almost everybody has turned a journalist, and uh, um, some people tell you that it has a negative effect on the media list. So, do you see that? Uh, no, basically, on my social media, I think um, the journalists and the media are doing their best. What we are trying to battle with now is fake news, and fake news really does not emanate from any journalist or media house. Most times, it's from individuals that have uh, um, an agenda to cause mayhem. Most times these people cannot be traced, neither are they tracked because they use pseudo accounts and pseudo um, properties to, to distribute their fake news. So I, I think the government in its own right is trying, basically most platforms itself, themselves, and try and, and monitor fake news, right? So I, I, I think that's basically what we are, we are fighting with fake news. Or you think the fight is possible? It is, it is possible. It is possible. I found that, you know, being on social media for a long time, uh, being a blogger uh, also for a very long time, I, I, I sometimes very easily know when, when it's a fake news. But trust me, uh, this Gen Z and young people that have not been online for a while cannot really tell. Mm, if I see a video, like somebody post, posted a video yesterday of cars burning in Abuja, I could easily tell. I saw that video some time past. I get him. So I immediately told the person, that's a fake news, that's old news. But for somebody that has not been on social media for a while and has never seen that video, we probably think Abuja is on fire. And, and begin to it, it, it cannot begin to spiral down it's into events that cannot be controlled, right? But um, the platforms are also helping, and most times when you report such an account, they take it down immediately. And is, is there any other role that you think the either the media itself can play in making sure that um, there is uh, this um, should I say this a uh, disparity between what is fake and then what is real? Um, yes, yes. I, 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 I even what I appeal to the media practitioners is to have a balanced. Um, an, ob an objective interpretation of news material because you can be easily be swayed to a direction based on your personal bias. It's very possible. And most times as a journalist, you don't even know when that happens. You just think you're talking, but uh, you're obviously swayed to a personal, you're swayed to a side because of your personal bias. And maintaining objectivity in the light of what is happening in Nigeria is very difficult, but uh, that's what our appeal to our, our journalists and our media houses to try as much as to emulate. But remember, remember, even America, that is the world's best democracy, you know that the CNN has a party and the Fox News has a party. I can't remember which one. One is Republican and one is Democratic. It's not hidden. Are you getting me? It's not hidden. But it's a very difficult thing to, to manage. The organization COA, which is um, the coalition of um, wife of a um, president and uh, vice president, is it still in operation? Well, we, we've upgraded that. It's now called Coalition of Women in Africa for Peace and Development. Coalition of Women in Africa for Peace and Development. It's still there. It's the umbrella body that organizes the summit. But the, the registered organization is the NGO, but there's an umbrella body called COA, which is the Coalition of Women in Africa for Peace and Development, that is the umbrella body for the African Women Summit. So what is the aim and objective of the body? Like I said, um, the summit is an advocacy arm, right, of our struggle as an NGO. So basically, COA is a bit simple. The name says it all, Coalition of Women in Africa for Peace and Development. The idea is to use women as agents of peace and sustainable development in Africa. Yes, all right. So stay um, working towards empowering the girl child. It still boils down to that, yes. The girl child, all right. Is there, is there a place of technology in all this, in all, in all these um, 
violations in these groups and all that? Is there any role that the technology on ICT can play? All right. Um, basically, uh, at the NGO, one of our aims, like I told you, is um, ending poverty and girl child education. So what we started is what we call the She Tech Hub. Um, we, we plan, by God's grace, that to be the largest hub for women in Africa. The idea is simple, to empower girls and women with tech, tech skills. We believe tech is the future. In short, we have gone beyond tech now. We are talking about artificial intelligence, right? But let's try and catch up with tech because it, AI is already disrupting the world. <laughs> um, Africa is still battling with getting into tech. But let's even try and get into tech, right? Now, people that study mobile application development might, might be out of touch because you have AIs that will build an app for you without any coding skills. Uh, but let's see, give them the coding skills. Let them let them have those coding skills. Let's start from somewhere. Yeah, so that, uh, that's why we are building them to give, give them skills in tech for free, as an NGO for free. And that's why we're looking for partners to help us do that. And after we've done 10 already, like, like I told you, as our pilot project, so we want to move to data analysis, right? Data analysis, um, we want to train 100 girls in data analysis and take it off from there. So we're very, very, very part of the movement of tech. I know the international movement that is coming up. The team is tech and ICT for women. So it's part of what we are doing. And uh, it's part of our project. Just behind me is a tech hub. Behind me, I'm sitting is a tech hub. Uh, 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 we just set it up for girls to empower them with tech skills. I will know that once you empower them, tech skills are highly paid skills, highly look sought out for skills and highly paid skills. Just empower, empowering one girl with a tech skill that she earns about $4,000 a month. See what her, her family has changed, her life has changed. And all the girls that work with us, none of them have had any idea in tech. So they joined us and four months later, because the training was for four months. And four months later, these girls are beginning to build apps and they are coders in their own rightful sense. And I have I've heard one or two things about coders, team coders, and the, the likes of it. But you agree with me that the penetration in the grassroots is still very low. What are your plans to reach these people? Well, um, like I said, most things can be done by governments. You cannot really do any everything. And the, the, the earlier you understand it as an NGO, the better, even though you kill yourself. Right. Um, when we wanted to do our tech hub, we sent out a uh, request for applications. We got about 200 entries that wanted to be, um, they wanted to learn this stuff. We didn't even have an academic qualification for it. We also, if you're interested in tech and you want to come, even if you don't have a laptop, right? We even got some people from other African countries writing, um, we wanted to be part of it, but we couldn't take them. So I uh, had to boil down to take people from our location, which is Abuja, because we, we didn't have the funds to transport people from other states to Abuja. Are you getting me? But like I said, governments can do this thing, and government can empower organizations like us to come to their locality and take the, the skill set to the grassroots. It's only government that can do that. No organization can do it, no matter the funding they have. And unlike us, I don't even have the funding. We have to do that from our personal pocket. Please, when you when you mean government, now because when you say government, Africans we are much more inclined to say when you say governments, we mean the presidency. Now when you mean both federal government, and state district, government. you say the federal. State or the local? Federal and state government. In Nigeria, there's actually and even the local, local government, government. Because all funds for the local government goes to the state governors. And the governors have refused, refused to accept local government autonomy. In the current bill that they are working on, the, the various state national assemblies have refused to accept the part of the bill that says local government should be autonomous. So until local governments are autonomous, they don't have funds for themselves to operate. They, they feed on whatever the state governments give to them. So we actually don't have a local government. So when I'm talking about the government, I'm talking about just the federal and the state government. The state government. It's all right. Thank you so much, Mr. Meshak Hart. We'll come back shortly after this break and then we'll discuss the African Women's Summit. Hello there. Looking for an African movie? Search no further. Cleveland African Movies TV is here for you. We are dedicated to the acceleration of African films, TV series, documentaries, and lots more. Explore our movies at home or on the go. Cleveland Movies is free to watch on Cleveland.com. Don't miss this opportunity. Hurry now. Sign up and subscribe today. Hello there. So now you welcome back and we are still with our guest for today, Mr. Belema Meshakat, and we're discussing the African Women's Summit 2023. And Mr. Had, I'd like to get back to you. These um, African Women's Summits, 
what is it all about? Just give us a, a background. Analysis. All right, the African American Summit started in 2018. The idea was to take advantage of the enormous capacity, goodwill, intellect of African women to develop the continent. That's the basic idea. Um, bringing African women together and getting their ideas on how to build the continent. That's why it's called sustainable development. And also letting them know and taking the message of peace back to their locality. Because if you look at it, wherever there is war and strife, who suffers most? The woman and her child. Are you getting me? The man finds a way to escape. Are you getting me? So we say women are peace ambassadors. And for the first time at this summit, we are launching a manual on peace education across Africa. And we'll be having training the trainers at that event so that women can go back to their countries and begin to train women on being peace ambassadors. So it's basically an event to bring women, African women together. And trust me, nobody what I have found out, if you put African women in a room and don't say anything, you've had a hugely successful event. African women together in a room are so excited about seeing themselves, are so excited about learning from themselves, are so excited of contributing to each other. So people have formed networks, have formed partnerships, have formed friendships, have formed relationships from 2018 that still exist till to, to date across the continent. Because our first event held in Abuja with over a thousand women from 34 African countries. Massive event, hugely successful event. And this fourth edition will be holding in Cape Town, South Africa. You know, but when we send out um, the forms for women to register, we always check what they say they want to see at the event. Most of them say they want to network, they want to meet new people, they want to learn new ideas, they want to grow themselves, they want to be a better person, they want to grow the content. Networking, so that's what this platform gives. A woman comes from Nigeria and she sees her colleague from Egypt, wow. How is Egypt? She begins to interact with the culture of Egypt. She sees one from Kenya, wow. So you see one from Gambia. And they don't see them like this. I mean, you hardly see women from other countries except you leave your country. And most times they don't even travel out. But by the time they come, it's a potpourri of women from across the continent. Every every single country, intelligent women discussing and generating groundbreaking issues that will be implemented across the continent. So it's, it's an event that we believe as we go on will be the World Economic Forum for Women in Africa. To, and this, this, these women don't just come from Africa. Let me tell you, they come from across the world. African women, wherever they are in the world, come across the world to, for this event. Um, it's, it's going to be a, a huge one for us at our first summit in Cape Town, South Africa. So this is your fourth edition? Yes, my fourth edition. My fourth edition. Okay. Now, where, where you just, okay, I heard you mention South Africa, but I don't think that was quite audible enough. So when is the venue of this event? Where are you having it? Okay. The fourth edition is holding from the 11th to the 13th of May at the Century City Conference Center in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, the first two days is for the summit, the third day is a tour. We always tour the city wherever we travel to, to learn, to see, to observe, and have experiences we can bring back home. And we'll also be sending some girls back to school in South Africa, because every country we visit, we want to give back to the society. So basically, that's the, the plan. So women will stay longer and just have the time to relax after um, a, a long work, 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 working environment. So Very that's important. it. So you mean you take the events around the countries, not just the particular place? What do you say? I think you mean you take the event round the countries. You don't use the particular, you don't cite it in a particular country, yearly. No, no, we go from countries. So 2018, we're in Nigeria, right? Um, 2019, we didn't hold the event. 2020, because when we started in Nigeria, we initially planned it for every two years because we didn't want it to be just something that comes to happen every year because we wanted to implement the results of the conference and see results. But later, we decided to make it every year. So, but 2020, COVID-19 struck. If you remember, so the whole world shut down 2020, so we could not have the event. While the, the world was opening in 2021, the only place we saw that could host everybody was Dubai. So in 2021, we went to Dubai and we had the conference in Dubai. 2022, we went to Kigali, um, Rwanda, and had one of our best conferences ever. Then this year, we are going to South Africa. As I speak to you, three African countries are beginning to host the 2024 edition, Liberia, Kenya, and Zambia. At the end of the event, we will determine who, which country would host the next edition, but we go from Africa, one African country to the other so that we can spread it. So for some women that do not know of this or your, your coalition that or this is your group and summit, how do they get access to you guys? Um they can visit our website www.africawomensummit.org 
Everything about the summit is there. How to contact us is there. If you need to register, is there. The registration fees are there. Everything. Um, just en ended our call for speakers. So I would have said if you also wanted to speak at the event, you had an opportunity, but the opportunity is closed. We have over 200 people that applied to speak at the event. We can barely take 10 or 15. Um, so there are opportunities to exhibit businesses also. And a lot of them have told us, ah, I make small um, Ankara, I make small things I want to exhibit. So there's opportunities for exhibitions at the e event also. Yeah. Thank you so much, you. So, the Cleveland team, we really, really appreciate you for your interest in the girls' style. You don't say that when you build a woman, you build a society, which is absolutely true. All right, let's get to hear of your last word for today's women, today African women. All right, um, I want to say that African women, believe in yourselves, you can do it. Um, that's why we organize the summit. One of the major reasons for organizing this summit is this intergenerational conversation. We like to bring women that have been able to succeed in their field and come and tell us how they did it. For instance, the Minister of Defense, Maldives, is a woman. She leads men in the uh, generals. She's our keynote speaker at this event. She will tell us how did she even live her life to this point. Got into politics, became very relevant, and she's now the Minister of Defense. Are uh, you getting me? The Vice President of Liberia, still Vice President of Liberia, will be at the summit also. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cape Verde will be at the summit also. Um, um, a, 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 the Minister for, from Egypt, the Minister from Egypt will be at the event. Um, no, a lady from Egypt will be at the event also. So part of what we do with our summit is to get people that have succeeded in their various fields to come and engage these women so that women see a ray of hope. They see possibilities at the end of the tunnel. They say, if this woman can do it, we can do it. That's the basic idea of the summit. And for the first time, this summit will be launching the 15 most influential women in Africa magazine, where as part of our efforts to deepen the conversation, because we have a lot of women that are leaving the scene, they are getting old and living the scene, but their stories are not being told. Are you getting me? And these young women, young girls, cannot learn from them. So we want them to begin to document their stories so that there will be somewhere somebody can go and say, Oh, I can see what this woman is doing. And we also have the touch bearers, people that are upcoming. You see a lot of young girls, young women across Africa doing a lot, but nobody's talking about them. We want to showcase them also at the summit, at the launch of this Africa. Most influential women magazine at the summit. 50 most influential African women at the summit. So, African women, believe in yourself, unite together, demand for what is yours, and um, come for the African Women Summit in Cape Town, South Africa. Thank you very much. Finally, a word for the government. Government, do what you're supposed to do. We will hold you accountable. That's a course cool one. <laughs> and I thank you so much, Mr. Han, for being our guest today. And we do hope you'll come about next time to discuss more of women in politics. Thank you so much. Thank you. So right, we'll run it up here for today. And uh, like I always say, and like I guess for today, say, women, you are very, very much important. You are very, very important. Instead of hiding, instead of shedding yourself, instead of thinking you are below or inferior to the male court, it's time you start rising up and taking your place in the society. Thank you so much for being with us until next week. When we come your way with another day, Franca, have a nice evening.